You asked and I delivered. Well, actually, you'll have to be the judge of that. Today, we're going to talk about a theoretical CJC-1295 dosing regimen that, according to the research, is logical and makes sense, at least to me, and I think so. To all my returning viewers, your support and interest has been amazing, and you make digging through all this information worth it. For those who are new here, welcome. If you do enjoy this video, just hit that like and subscribe button. At this time last year, I was at like 100 subs, so the fact that we just hit 2,000 is beyond belief. I don't know if we can get to 10,000. Is it a pipe dream? Let's find out. CJC-1295, a peptide developed by a company called Conjuchem, hence the CJC, is one that we've discussed pretty frequently here on the channel. I'll hit the nuts and bolts as far as a review goes, but for the nitty gritty details, check out the previous videos which I'll throw in the description below. As many agree, this is a pretty interesting peptide, a unique one. It's a growth hormone releasing hormone agonist, and its structure isn't that far off from Sermoralins. It's essentially the same thing. What makes it unique is Conjuchem's creation of a drug affinity complex, or DAC, which is most oftentimes added to the peptide, and it's essentially a chemically reactive linker molecule that covalently attaches CJC to albumin, prolonging its half-life significantly. Sermoralin's half-life is between 10 and 25 minutes. CJC-1295 with DAC's half-life is like 6 to 8 days. What's this mean? It means that it takes much, much longer for CJC-1295 to be completely metabolized than it would for all these other growth hormone releasing peptides. But I suspect that comes with a cost, which we'll get into a little bit later. And thankfully, unlike with some of these experimental peptides, we've got some research although limited, to base a dosing recommendation off of. The first of which we'll discuss is a study published in 2006 that gave healthy men ages 21 to 61 different doses of CJC-1295 and evaluated physiologic outcomes. The caveat here is that the study consisted of a small number of participants, and what they did was measure a few different variables including CJC concentration, growth hormone concentration, and IGF-1 concentration. And of importance, initial max drug concentrations were found to be between 60 and 90 minutes, and estimated half-life was found to be between 5.8 and 8.1 days, hence the popular belief that this half-life floats between 6 and 8 days. And there visibly exists a dose-dependent increase in growth hormone, as in the more you're given, the higher the GH measurements obtained. And similar results were exhibited with downstream production of serum IGF-1 concentrations, with less variability between 60 micrograms per kilogram and 125 micrograms per kilogram. Most apparent side effects were injection site irritability, headache, diarrhea, and systemic vasodilatory effects like flushing, and in some cases transient hypotension or intermittent drops in blood pressure, with greatest prevalence understandably in the 250 micrograms per kilogram dose group, which was the maximum that people received. It was most well tolerated at the 30 and 60 microgram per kilogram group, which we're going to keep in mind. And smartly, the researchers indicated in their discussion of results that the most appropriate dosing regimen should be determined from longer term studies, which unfortunately we've yet to have gotten. Hence my hesitancy to make these sorts of videos and the disclaimer at the beginning, which I'll repeat here. This isn't medical advice, this isn't a recommendation, or my support of use of experimental compounds, but instead an educational assessment of the data. And I hope you find it informative. You can let me know. What we just discussed is essentially the hallmark study with regards to dosing, and it's got some flaws. Predominantly in sample size and inadequate assessment of negative feedback to the hypothalamus, which is of course incredibly difficult to assess, especially with short-term data heightened by our limited laboratory ability to even do so. Another study conducted in 2006 and published by the JCEM, or Journal of Clinical Endocrinology and Metabolism, performed an admittedly too small to deem significant sample size study that took people ages 20 to 40, and in their minimal research concluded that between 60 and 90 micrograms per kilograms, that growth hormone pulsatility was preserved and resulted in increased basal growth hormone and IGF-1 levels. Without a statistically significant difference between between the two groups, and correlating growth hormone release with IGF-1 release was exhibited to be unsuccessful and could be affected by age, body mass, and other variables that could not be, or were not, well controlled for in this study, which just highlights the extreme difficulty of doing a test where there is not just variability amongst individuals with regards to GH and IGF-1 production, but also it highlights the complexity of this physiologic pathway and the limited tools we have to actually measure this stuff. Alright, so we'd be doing ourselves a disservice if we didn't mention this, and many online 
fine peptide marketers seem to be leaving this part out, but let's dive into legitimate clinical evaluation through clinical trials. So Conjuchem was evaluating CJC1295 DAC GRF with phase 2 clinical trials at a similar time that a company called Theratechnologies Inc. was evaluating a similar growth hormone releasing hormone peptide in phase 3 trials called TH9507, also known as Tessamorelin, which we know has amazingly gained FDA approval. And they were both being discussed for management of the same destructive effects of chronic illness, in particular AIDS wasting or HIV related lipodystrophy. But CJC's evaluation was halted due to dum 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 the death of a study participant. And the goal was to evaluate CJC 1295's efficacy at escalating doses from 60 to 120 to 240 micrograms per kilograms versus placebo, with plans to increase the length of the study after the first part of it. And the circumstances surrounding the individual who died are vague and kept mostly under wraps, but it's unclear whether it had to do with the administration of the peptide itself. And you know me, I try my best to be a peptide investigative journalist. I don't know if you remember us digging up the governmental Samoralin documents to assess its discontinuation, but I enjoy trying to dissect the reasoning behind certain decisions. But to be frank, gaining access to preliminary results and outcomes from the study has been freaking tough. And although there is a circulating theory that one of the docs involved thinks the patient was someone with coronary artery disease who had a ruptured plaque, i.e. a heart attack, good luck finding confirmation. So now here we are trying to find an appropriate dosing regimen. I will say that anybody who tells you that making sense of this is easy is either brilliant or full of it. Regardless, I'll try my best. As is visible, Although there exists dose dependence with regards to increases in GH, there seems to be limiting return on investment, if you will, with regards to adverse effects. And I'm a start low, go slow kind of guy, as you've seen in the BPC-157 dosing video, so we're going to replicate that here. And to be kindly, we'll say that the US average body weight is likely a bit high, so I'm going to use 70 kilograms as a base marker here, which puts us at about 154 pounds and some change. So if I had to assess a baseline dose where efficacy with regards to GH and IGF one increases meets adequate safety risk, I would say that that's about 60 micrograms per kilograms per day with a general most tolerated safety protocol between 30 and 60 micrograms per kilogram. But I wouldn't want to start there given the prevalence of side effects and prolonged half-life, which means that an adverse reaction is likely to last longer. So we multiply 30 micrograms per kilograms by 70 kilograms and we get 2100. So for simplicity's sake, let's just make that 2000 micrograms weekly as a starting dose with a plan to up titrate given adverse effect profile and perceived results slash experience. I like the idea of going five days on, two days off, and I think you can alter this a bit depending on your weight and schedule if you'd like. But I would start with 400 micrograms per day times five or this 2000 micrograms weekly for the first week. And I would say if you have adverse effects, stop not worth it. If you're finding success or feeling okay, or you feel like there's more room to improve, we could slowly increase until week four, where even if we assume a 70 kilogram body weight and we take the most effective dose at 60 micrograms, although this is unconfirmed, this puts us at about 4,200 micrograms of the peptide per week as a goal endpoint. However, for this first cycle, quote unquote, I don't think it's worth getting there as predominantly we should be seeing how we tolerate the peptide in the first place. And I highlight that if at any point you're feeling good and achieving your goals, stay. It's not worth the risk of increase at this point, albeit what the limited research says. So there's nothing wrong with a range if you're doing good, feeling good, looking good, whatever it is you want. So for sake of safety and what I can ascertain from the research, we're going to go from 30 micrograms per kilogram, assuming 70 as a baseline weight, to 40, to 45, to 50. That is, if up titration is needed and you've been feeling good up until this point. Here's a chart demonstrating this. So week one, we've got 2,000 micrograms total, which puts us just below 30 micrograms per kilogram, assuming a body weight of 70 kilograms. Five days on with a two day break, 400 micrograms per day. And I highlight for all of these stages, if you're feeling good, achieving perceived goal effects, just stay here. Then if we up titrate to 40 micrograms per kilograms, that puts us at about 2,800 micrograms for the week or 560 micrograms per day for five days. Then we get to 45 for week three, putting us at 3,150 micrograms for the week, which is about 630 micrograms per day for five days with a two day break. 
break. And finally, if you manage to up titrate all the way here, we're at about 50 micrograms per kilogram or 3,500 micrograms for the week, which puts us at about 700 micrograms per day for five days with a two day break, which is sure below 60 micrograms per kilogram. However, none of this is confirmed with regards to both safety and efficacy. There does exist a dose dependent relationship between dose and GH and IGF-1 production. And this is a start low, go slow protocol where we try our best to control for risks and benefits. And of course, this is highly individual. That said, I hope you enjoyed this video, found it informational, educational, maybe a bit enjoyable. I don't know. If you did like it, just hit that like and subscribe button. It's the best way to help a small peptide YouTuber like myself. If not, you can throw a dislike, call us out, initiate a public outcry, whatever it is you really want to do. That said, thank you for the time and for watching. I appreciate you all as always, and it's been a pleasure to make these videos. Thank you and have a great day.